In this video, I want to talk about somatosensory symptoms and signs. And there's a lot of different terms that have been applied to this. So it's mostly just kind of going over the definitions and distinctions between these terms. And as a reminder, a symptom is an abnormality reported by the patient that we also often call subjective. And a sign is an abnormality found by a clinician that we often refer to as objective. Dysfunction of somatosensory axons in nerves or in posterior spinal nerve roots may cause the symptom of numbness or the sign of somatosensory loss or diminished somatosensation, usually of all modalities or types of somatosensation of the innervated areas of the body. So for example, let's say we're talking about one of the nerves here going to the hand or coming from the hand in the wrist. So we'll say this nerve right here has a lesion or an area of abnormality. Even though the lesion is here in this nerve, this may be the area of abnormal somatosensation, where the patient may complain of a somatosensory symptom like numbness. They may say, I feel numb in this area. Or the clinician may find the sign of somatosensory loss in this area when they're examining somatosensory function in this area. Because this nerve is bringing all that somatosensory information from this area into the central nervous system for perception. Now, not everybody's going to use this word numbness the same way but mostly what we're talking about when somebody says I feel numb in a certain area is this subjective experience of having reduced somatosensation. Now dysfunction of peripheral somatosensory axons may also cause in addition to numbness and somatosensory loss several other somatosensory abnormalities. The first of these we call paresthesias and we usually use this term for spontaneous or evoked positive positive somatosensory symptoms that are not unpleasant. The most common example of this is a tingling sensation or a mild pins and needles sensation. Now this can be spontaneous where there is no stimulus being applied but a person may say there's just a spontaneous feeling of tingling through this area that's not unpleasant and we would call that in medical terminology paresthesias. Another positive somatosensory symptom we call dysesthesias and this is a spontaneous positive somatosensory symptom that is unpleasant or painful. And a common example of this would be a burning sensation. A person may say, I have a burning sensation on the skin here, even when there's no stimulus, there's no heat or anything like that. Now, paresthesia is a little bit unusual in that respect that it can be spontaneous. There may be no stimulus here, but paresthesias can also be evoked. So for instance, if I lightly touch this skin, in addition to them feeling me touch the skin, they may say that evokes a tingling sensation that we would call paresthesias. And a last one of these is something we call allodynia, and that is the perception of pain to a stimulus that is not normally noxious or painful. So for example, if I lightly touch this skin and a person gets a painful sensation, like a burning sensation or a stabbing sensation, we would call that allodynia. So these three could be called positive somatosensory abnormalities because there's some something extra in addition to the normal somatosensory function. And that's opposed to what we could call negative somatosensory abnormalities, such as numbness or somatosensory loss, where there isn't something extra, there's just a loss of function. Now this distinction can be helpful clinically because negative somatosensory abnormalities can be seen with dysfunction in the periphery, these somatosensory axons in the periphery, or lesions in the central nervous system. Either way, we can get negative somatosensory abnormalities. And that's also true for positive somatosensory abnormalities. However, these tend to occur much more often with peripheral lesions, lesions out here in the peripheral nervous system, and much less often with lesions in the central nervous system. So it's not a perfect way to distinguish between central and peripheral lesions, but it does start to add some evidence if you have positive somatosensory abnormalities that the lesion is more likely to be in the peripheral nervous system. So somatosensory abnormalities may include any or all of the symptoms of numbness, paresthesias, dysesthesias, or allodynia, or the sign of somatosensory loss. Now, when you're trying to locate the lesion, it's helpful to know that symptoms from dysfunction of somatosensory pathways may radiate 
which is just the medical word for spread, beyond the somatosensory territory of that structure. But the sign of somatosensory loss is usually restricted just to the territory of that pathway. So if we look at this example where there's a lesion of this particular nerve in the wrist, and we'll get into this in more detail later when we talk about median neuropathy at the wrist or the carpal tunnel syndrome, but patients will often complain of symptoms of not just this area of the hand, but other parts parts of the hand and sometimes even up into the forearm or even more proximal arm. So the symptoms may radiate beyond the territory of this nerve at this spot, but the signs of somatosensory loss will usually stick to the normal anatomy of that nerve or that lesion. Now when it comes to examining somatosensory loss, we can often roughly quantify it on examination by applying the same stimulus to normal and abnormal areas of the skin, and then asking the patient to estimate a percentage that they feel the stimulus compared to 100% on normal skin. So for example, if this area of the hand is affected, I might touch that area and ask them to give me a percent that they're able to feel it compared to the other hand where they're not having that abnormality. Now, somatosensory sensation can be quickly screened by touch, or it can be examined in more detail for the other primary modalities of somatosensation. And modalities is just the medical term for the different kinds or the different types of somatosensation. Now touch sense we often separate into gross touch sense and fine touch sense. And what we mean by that is that gross touch perception is usually poorly localized to a large area while fine touch sense localizes to a small area such as distinguishing between two points applied very close together on the skin. And the reason we make this distinction is that fine and gross touch sense usually travel in different tracks in the central nervous system, so that may help us to localize a lesion. Pain sense is usually examined with a pin or another sharp object, or for patients with decreased arousal, we may use nail bed pressure, where pressure is applied to either the fingernails or the toenails to assess the response. Temperature sense is usually examined with the cool metal of a tuning fork, because we often have those around, but any cool or warm object could be used to test temperature sense. Vibration sense is examined with a vibrating tuning fork held against a bone prominence, so like a knuckle on a finger or an elbow or the patella on the knee. Position sense, also called proprioception, is examined by passively moving a joint with the patient's eyes closed. And passive movement refers to the examiner moving a body part rather than the patient moving it. So for example, I might hold the patient's thumb, have them close their eyes and relax, and I would then lift the thumb up or down and ask them which way I'm lifting it to see if they have the position sense when they're not looking at the affected body part. So that's a quick run through some of these terms we use for abnormal somatosensation, and then we'll get into lots of examples of this when we start looking at specific lesions and syndromes later on.